direction of voting along regionalized party lines. In the West, the action group was to form the regional government after NCNC legislators had crossed the floor to join them. By 1958, talks in London were preparing the way for independence within two years. Back in Nigeria, there was now a national government grouping all the major parties. The conference looked at the question of giving minorities a voice in the new Nigeria, but it decided not to create more regions or states. It was an issue that would return to haunt the politicians in the years to come. For these negotiators were to be key figures in Nigeria after independence. It was here that the colonial secretary, Lennox Boyd, announced the final date for independence, October the 1st, 1960. It began in May of last year. By now, no politicians wanted to be seen to delay the target date. The British were about to hand over. But their exploitation of Nigeria's resources, their disregard of its growth, their encouragement of divisions, these were all handicaps which Nigerians would now have to overcome. Despite the years of negotiation, Nigeria was ill-prepared for the handover. The British had marked the country. They'd promoted the values of traders and middlemen at the expense of native pride in agriculture. As a result, farming had been neglected. There had been little investment in its future. Farming was no longer seen as a desirable job by most Nigerians, and this would have serious consequences later. The much vaunted Nigerianization did indeed bring Africans into offices, but only as potential clerks for a colonial bureaucracy. To make the new institutions work for them, Nigerians needed expertise in politics, in social welfare, in the economy. They weren't given the chance to acquire it. Education had been geared to spreading European values. The European status had been based on practical expertise. They'd been in no hurry to pass it on to Africans. These inadequacies were to cast their shadow well into the future. Many of today's Nigerians have had to overcome the inheritance of those years. I've had a particular uh, interest in repairing things and being an engineer. And when I left school, my, my father sent me to work with the Royal Signals. Uh, in my hometown at Abeokuta. But uh, when my uncle found, uh, heard that I was going to be an engineer, he advised me that uh, if I became an engineer, the uh, colonial powers did not like uh, people in the colonies to be engineers, and that I would not have the opportunity of independent practice. Uh, I'll be made to work under strict supervision all the time. They believed that at that time that it was a very highly skilled profession and maybe it would accelerate the move towards independence if we had many engineers who could do things for ourselves. We'd be more self-reliant and less dependent on uh, engineers from Britain. 1959, the election campaign to choose Nigeria's first government after independence, a campaign that covered every area of the country. The elections would confirm previous trends, particularly the regional bases of the parties. The Northern People's Congress again won most seats in the Federal Assembly. It was to hammer out a coalition with the NCNC, leaving the action group back in opposition. Once again, the pattern of future politics was set. No single party had won a large enough majority to govern alone. With these elections then, the first stage on the road to nationhood was complete, yet the legacy left by the British 
carried an unmistakable warning. The task of truly unifying the country was still ahead. But one would have thought that uh, the process of uniting this country should have started when they were here, but perhaps because of the, the policy which they had been identified with of divide and rule, they kept the different parts of the country separate for quite some time and left the country like this. This made it very difficult for the leaders, uh, Nigerian leaders after independence, to bring, the, bring about national unity so easily and so quickly. Policies of divide and rule had served British interests, but now the British were leaving, leaving Nigerians to face the consequences. And in fact, some of that, uh, some of that legacy was in fact quite uh, deleterious to immediate progress. Take, for instance, the, the, the increased separation of the North from the South, which was for me a deliberate act of, uh, shall we say, colonial villainy. Uh, realizing that a very feudal north would be amenable to, uh, to that sense of, uh, of continuing power in some form or the other. In other words, the protection of that form of society, which for me is incompatible, is contradictory to you know, any kind of sense of democracy. But the British, it was in their interest to protect that feudalistic uh, political uh, structure Observers like Shoyinka felt that the colonial legacy should be swept aside completely, that Nigeria should set out to create its own cultural identity. For me, it was up to us to create whatever society we wanted, right from scratch. We talk about the legacy of the colonial masters. And we would only talk in terms of um, the physical structures, the introduction into, uh, into the mainstream of European uh, world, commerce, arts, uh, technologies, and so on and so forth. I mean, those were undeniable legacies. And these one had to take for granted. But in terms of the, the cultural being of the, of the nation, we felt this was something which had to be constructed all over again uh, because of the interruption which we'd had by this colonial uh, legacy. Uh, outside of that, I didn't really think much about the Europeans remaining part of our existence. I thought now we were really taking over. A new age, the end of a century of foreign domination that Nigerians everywhere could welcome. The country had gained a constitution, a place in the community of nations. But the colonial power had created rifts in Nigerian society and exploited them for its own ends. That exploitation by the British would leave its mark for many years into the future. Today, three decades on, Nigeria is a concrete reality, a unified country. But at independence, the journey ahead was to be long. There'd be bitter lessons on the way. For in the years that followed 1960, the colonial legacy was to lead the newly born nation into instability and conflict. Mm -hmm.
On October the 1st, 1960, Nigeria became an independent sovereign state. It had been a peaceful transition of power. There was some awareness of regional tensions, but most people felt these would be overcome in the interests of national unity. On this day, all potential problems seemed insignificant as Nigeria rejoiced and looked to its leaders for inspiration and guidance into a new era. Abubakar Tafawa Balewa continued as Prime Minister. He reflected the country's optimism. For Nigeria, it's a year of very great events. We attained our independence on the 1st of October. Dr. Namdi Azikiwi was appointed Governor General. He expressed joy and hope at heading the newly independent nation. If I am asked whether I'm happy, because Nigeria is free, and the Nigerian government appears to be stable, and the people of Nigeria are apparently satisfied that the price of freedom and the price our leaders paid for it were worth the sacrifice, I would answer in the affirmative. This optimism was shared throughout Nigerian society. In 1960, when we attained independence, I was a student in uh, a government secondary school in Bida in Niger State. So we were, I was in Form 4 at that time, and I was reasonably aware of the political development in the country at that age, but I think I was about age 19. And uh, by then, like any newly independent African country, we were looking forward to a great country at that time. I was very optimistic. A young man, I was in the army, and uh, one sees the uh, sky as the limit uh, for Nigeria and Nigerians, um, at least from what we knew. I was very optimistic um, before and after independence. I had a vision of a great Nigerian nation, a leading nation in, in Africa. We were all very, very enthusiastic, very, very hopeful for independence. Then, of course, it meant we shall be taking charge of a lot of things and doing things ourselves. And so one looked forward to uh, independence with hope and aspirations. I had hoped that, that uh, it would not take us long before we all would forget most of the differences that still are left around. I had hoped that Nigeria would be the real giant of Africa, that will be a force to be reckoned with, not only in Africa, but also in the whole world. Very optimistic. I think nothing will ever go wrong. Three years later, Nigeria was to become a republic, with Dr. Azikiwe as president. I, Namdi Azikiwe, swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and that I will preserve, protect... Although there be severe challenges ahead, Nigeria seemed determined to take its rightful place in Africa and the world community. At independence, Nigeria had great potential. It seemed to have overcome any limitations imposed by its colonial legacy. The country had enormous resources, and while the rest of Africa struggled for independence, Nigeria provided a shining example of how to go about it peacefully. Nigeria seemed a sea of tranquility compared to elsewhere in Africa. In the Congo, there were bitter divisions between rival claimants. In Kenya, the nationalist leader, Jomo Kenyatta, remained in detention. And in South Africa, there was political repression of the black majority, 
Against all of this, Nigeria seemed an exception, and yet the years following independence were to see crises, coups, and a civil war, events which would dim the early hopes. The colonial legacy had left Nigeria's regions not only intact, but with greater autonomy. At independence, the country inherited a federation of three regions. The North's inhabitants, mainly Muslims, were about half of Nigeria's total population, but the North's people were spread over a wider area than the other regions. Colonialism had helped confirm these existing regional differences. It had transformed cultural diversity between the regions into political adversity between local rulers. This divide and rule strategy was a hallmark of British colonialism, but in Nigeria, it was perfected. From these buildings at Lokoja, the policy of indirect rule was propagated by Lord Lugard. The strategy meant ruling colonies through existing tribal rulers. It ensured people were loyal, and it saved on the cost of administration. It was a practical way of governing vast tracts of land. Indirect rule worked well in the north, where hereditary rulers were established. But in the south, it gave exaggerated status to local chiefs. In all, the divide and rule policy strengthened regional thinking, especially among political leaders. This was to be a problem throughout Africa. In Nigeria, regional rivalries caused friction right from the start, although some people felt they could live with regionalism. Well, why not? I mean, in England, for instance, you've got you know, not the several regions, you've got the Welsh, uh, Scots, the Irish, the nationalisms in the, in, uh, in the British Isles, the nationalism there is still very, very deep seated, both cultural and political. Uh, even the laws, uh, the, some Scottish laws, for instance, are not quite accepted or <laughs> in uh, the main, uh, the English, in the English uh, part of the uh, United Kingdom. So you can still have a nation. You can still have a nation if you have what you might call a general common denominator, which is acceptable uh, to everybody. In Nigeria in 1960, the National Assembly was the stage for a multi-party government bequeathed by the colonial power. They'd imposed the constitution, adapting their Westminster model into a federation of autonomous regions. This meant it was impossible to form a majority party or even a stable majority coalition. The largest region, the North, had most seats in the legislature. There was the fact also that you had three regions of independence, of which one claimed 50% of the seats in the legislature because they claimed to have more than 50% of the population. There were three major political parties with regional bases. Each was the strongest party in its region. The Northern People's Congress formed the largest single Northern Party as before independence. Because this was the biggest region, the NPC was also prominent in the federal executive and legislature. The National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons had its support base in the Eastern region. The action group from the Western region became the major opposition party. This then was the political lineup. The First Republic was ruled by a coalition between the northern-based NPC and the eastern-based NCNC. The dominant party in each region had status because it had been ruling there for several years, so minorities weren't catered for. This caused resentment. Nigeria's minorities were many and spread throughout the country. They had no political influence. Politicians made things worse. They accentuated regional loyalties, and they cashed in on the resulting tensions to further their careers. They had different ideas of what regionalism meant. Before you can belong to the country, you must belong to a home. You belong to a home. That home must be in one region, but must be in a division. That division must be in one region or the other. So charity begins at home. You must, of all, belong to a small unit before you can belong to a bigger unit. Because we had a common purpose, we had to work together and sink our differences in order to succeed in building a new nation. 
which is called Nigeria. The politicians who'd sought independence were now in positions of influence. Nigeria had found its way through peaceful negotiation and leadership by compromise. Since there'd been no prolonged or bloody independence struggle, there were no heroic national figures. The popularity of political leaders had been regionally based throughout independence negotiations. Mr. Chairman, we congregate today in order to finish the business of constitution making, which we started last year. The keynote of this conference should be independence for united Nigeria. Dr. Namdi Azikiwi, the NCNC leader, had been a major figure in the negotiations. He'd been Eastern Region Premier before independence. Azikiwi had been the only politician popular outside his region. Now he was Governor General, soon to be President. Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, the Prime Minister, was a leading NPC member. He was known for his political moderation. He'd been leader of the government since 1957, before independence. Chief Obafemi Awolowu, a leading member of the action group, was effectively leader of the opposition. He too had played a part in independence negotiations and was a popular Western Region Premier. Those leaders had the asset of Nigeria's economy. Unlike most African states, it held great potential for development. It was already a huge market and had substantial oil resources. The nation was the dominant economic power in black-ruled Africa. Its share of Africa's total wealth was to rise steadily after independence. And Nigeria's economy would continue to grow at a stunning 8% a year, well into the 1970s. It was to be a remarkable achievement. But in those early years after independence, regional thinking pervaded every aspect of the country. The economy reflected this. New development resources were used to serve party and personal ends. Regional governments had power over welfare and public work contracts. This offered opportunities for patronage and helped consolidate the power of each governing party, all the more so because construction projects were booming. This division of resources led to regions having virtually self-contained economic systems. In the regions, because of the autonomy, they tried to build up institutions which would help the common man. Of course, there was, among the institutions, certain institutions which became commercial, commercialized, like public corporations, marketing boards, and so on. And perhaps it is due to that form of uh, government-sponsored corporations and companies that people tend to think that way. If we had succeeded in trying to tolerate one another politically, we might have achieved much more than we have achieved so far. Because there is this politics of hate, tribalism, bring down of syndrome, which characterized the politics of the Second and the, the First Republics. And uh, if we had avoided all these, we might have made much more progress. Most politicians were success conscious, and to prove they were successful, some led extravagant lifestyles. Critics alleged they were no better than their former colonial masters, or the warrant chiefs the colonialists had created to serve them. <laughs> 
Within five years of independence, political leaders of all parties and from every region were seen as bickering opportunists out for personal gain, with no concern for those they ruled. They'd been ill-prepared for the political roles they now had to play. I think the politicians were very much out of their depth. Uh, they, and they wanted things too easy. The, shall we say, the, the radicals among them, even the radicals among them, succumbed to the sheer lure of office, the pleasure of office for its own sake. Uh, the various grandiose schemes which we used to hear about, Pan-Africanism, uh, kind of social, uh, program of social equality and so on, all that disappeared under the manipulation of regional interests, of group interests. In the old Western region, a crisis began which illustrated all these divisions in society. It began with personality clashes between two of the region's main political figures in its dominant action group party, Chief Awolowa, opposition leader, and the AG's man in Lagos, and Chief Akintola, Western Region Premier. Awolowa took a hard line against the federal government, while Akintola was prone to be more accommodating. He favored a return to the pre-1959 days, when the action group played a more active part in government. Akintola felt he could do more to placate his supporters if he had more influence at the center. He wanted to be on more cooperative terms with the federal government. But Awolowa firmly believed that the opposition's role is to oppose. These differences between the two men were also the result of a strong personal rivalry with strong feelings on both sides. Awolowa wanted to retain control of the Western Region government. Things were to come to a head at the Action Group's Congress in February of 1962. There, Awolowa and his supporters removed Akintola from the premiership. In reaction, Akintola's supporters created such disruption that the Western House of Assembly was suspended. Leaders on both sides whipped up public sentiment, and in the ensuing disorder, the federal government declared a state of emergency in the West. The conflict was partly about where to compromise with the federal government. Since Chief Akintola was now premier, and Chief Aulawo was now the leader of the opposition. There was suspicion on the part of Chief Akitola that maybe Chief Aulawo didn't want him to succeed. That was why all these things were being done. Whereas the, the attitude of the national executive was that all the sacrifices were necessary in order to commend the party to a larger number of people in the country. That was, that was the cause of the problem. These personal and political rivalries were to heighten instability in the Western region. Federal government had to intervene. This added to tension between the regional and federal governments. Relations between the two had already been strained. Within six months of independence, the federal government had proposed the creation of a new Midwest region to be carved out of the existing West. The action group feared such a move would split its support base. It opposed the idea, but the new Midwest state went ahead as planned. It was seen by Awolowa supporters as a means of reducing the action group's force in opposition. We said it was unfair that we should have a Midwestern state created from the West, which was the smallest, and leave the others uh, without creating them. That was our attitude. What we, we said, what was first for the good, was first for Uganda. Amid instability in the Western region, the federal government appointed a commission to look into the affairs of six Western Region public corporations. Also, treason charges were leveled against Awolowa. He and some of his supporters were imprisoned. They felt the government was being vindictive towards the opposition. Among the ministers in the ruling coalition was Ohaji Shehu Shagari. As a political party, every party wants, of course, to have uh, the preponderance because they want to run government. And it's a healthy competition between the political parties. And there was no question of one party trying to demolish another party. But every party wanted to have an ascendancy. 
The Western region crisis symbolized the political atmosphere of this early period after independence. The colonial legacy of divide and rule had paved the way for political leaders to behave as opportunists. That damaging inheritance was now yielding a bitter harvest of division throughout the country. The institutions bequeathed to Nigeria had helped to heighten tensions. In all parts of the nation, personal rivalries born out of political ambition became a feature of politics. For all these reasons, many Nigerians felt little involvement with the way they were governed. Politicians seemed to put the interests of their region before those of the country. This was apparent when population figures became sensitive. Why should themselves be so sensitive? It just means that some politicians were determined from the outset to make a kind of political issue out of it. It had to do with uh, revenue sharing, it had to do with, uh, uh, with even uh, power also, political power. It had to do with the kind of constitution which was, uh, which was uh, inaugurated, in which representation uh, became virtually a matter of uh, population. And since regions had already been defined in such rivaling terms, it meant that you could swamp the federal house the, with, the, with sheer numbers in terms of the number of seats. The sharing of what the Nigerians call a national kick was mainly based upon population. Sharing of revenue, representation in parliament, <coughs> and Development was all based upon population, and everybody wanted to have more. So there was this competition about having more population in order that they would get a better share or larger share of the national kick. The political scene may well have been uncertain, but independent Nigeria could at last find its own path to development. The nation modernized, and the results were impressive. Revenues from growing business and industry meant government could increase capital spending. As a result, Nigeria has become one of Africa's most modern and socially progressive nations. The priority after independence was to transform Nigeria into a technologically advanced society. The building of new infrastructure was to help speed up progress by improving transport and communications. The country's previous infrastructure had been laid down to suit the needs of colonial rulers to get cheap raw materials out as fast as possible. With independence, the serious task of building Nigeria to suit Nigerian needs could begin, an affirmation of self-reliance. A priority was to provide better links between rural and urban areas. This was a gigantic task given the sheer size of the country. Rivers had traditionally been a focal point for all movement within the country. Improved water transport became an important development area. Nigerian railways grew rapidly during this time as the network spread throughout the country. By the 1960s, too, Nigerian Airways was playing its part in improving links between major towns all over the country. It had already been up and running in the mid-50s after the Calypso's maiden flight from London to Kano in northern Nigeria. Now, the national airline extended its domestic services to take in more towns and cities. More business activity meant better communications were needed. Numbers of post offices shot up tenfold in the four years after independence. As businesses modernized, there was a greater demand for telecommunications also. So staff had to be trained if the country was to realize its hopes for industrial and commercial growth. Of course, it was a good thing. The Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation now embarked on a 10-year development plan to extend its services. 
television was a way of bringing the country together. A plan for a federal television service was already in place at Independence, and it started transmitting in 1962. The government emphasized the educational role of the new medium. Before independence, Nigeria had already been the very first African country with a television service. Western Nigerian TV had begun transmitting from Ibadan with a few services to Lagos. WNTV was now to prove a useful precedent for the national network. The aim was to train Nigerian technicians and producers. But it was capital projects such as the Kainji Dam, which were the cornerstones of development. At first, the reservoir created by the dam was to be used for fishing and for irrigation. But as demand for electricity grew, Kainji's generating power would be increased. On completion, the dam was the biggest in Africa. Projects like these helped reaffirm independence, a mood of self-sufficiency. Development is admission of the aspiration of our people for self-reliance. Of course, it cannot be achieved in a short time, but that was the goal. And um, every government plans development with that in view. There was no doubt that we had both the natural and human resources in abundance. And of course, uh, it was a good thing. The well-being of Nigeria's people was high on the agenda. Massive capital spending went on social welfare projects. Sports facilities were a major development area, still in their infancy in Nigeria. As lifestyles changed, new housing estates sprang up in the suburbs to provide better modern accommodation. Despite these changes, Nigeria's economy was still primarily agricultural, even if diverse by African standards. In 1960, over two-thirds of the labor force worked on the land. Despite emerging industry, agriculture still accounted for over half the nation's wealth. There was no doubting Nigeria's immense land resources, but the arable land was often underused. Colonial education had trained Nigerians to trade rather than produce. Production was mainly in the cotton and groundnut areas in the north, and in the tree crop belt in the south. Main cash crops included groundnuts, cotton, cocoa, palm oil, rubber, and timber. But from 1962, agricultural exports began to stagnate. It was a trend which coincided with a new development pattern in the mid-60s. In place of food production, an expansion in timber, textiles, rubber, as well as a rapidly growing production in coal. And yet, by far the biggest growth was in oil. From being a mainly agricultural country, Nigeria was all set to become a major oil producer with large petroleum deposits. These were discovered in southeastern Nigeria in the 1950s. Exports began in 1958, and since then, oil has steadily increased its share of exports. Increased earnings from oil exports gave Nigeria high economic growth within a decade of independence. The country also had large reserves of natural gas and other minerals. The oil gave a tremendous boost to government revenue, but there were drawbacks. Its development diverted resources from agriculture and manufacturing. The problem was that with oil revenues, Nigeria could import more foreign products. This lowered the incentive for home production. Oil changed the whole uh, situation from an agro-based agro economy to an oil economy. And uh, 
the advent of oil has changed a lot of things in Nigeria, as you well know. Uh, perhaps to the detriment of agriculture, which we regretted. Uh, what we ought to have done was right from the beginning when these oil resources became predominant in the 